So can we show the, uh, Hema, I sent you a picture today. We've got them, I think. Can we show it? Yeah. So this is a story about the last fan in the stands. I actually dig this so much. So post game for us is, it takes forever. So um, my post game right now involves, uh, we kind of run around the stadium, say hi to everybody. I'll do a quick uh, BYU TV thing. Then we go in the locker, we meet with the team, we do a debrief with the staff. Then we go in the back, the, the um, south uh, east corner of the southwest corner of the building, and we meet with the media, the, the, the uh, print media, and then we'll come do radio with you. And the whole ordeal is like, I don't know, 45 minutes, give or take. When he says ordeal, it's not really that bad. It is, he, no, it's he awesome. enjoys it. It's an ordeal, but when I get to Greg, <laughs> it's like that's what makes life worth living. Exhale, is when I get and to it's do so much fun, yes. and, then, and then after that, I meet with the squad. And now, like, the squad is so convinced that I'm a disaster. Like, we meet for like an hour, right? So we go through all the meetings. This is a couple weeks ago. And we walk out, and sure enough, in the stands, Leanne actually saw him. I came back out to meet Leanne, and there's a father and his son sitting in the stands. The, there's no one in the arena. Like, it's, it's me and you and them. And so Leanne, as she always does, hollers out to him. And so we, we have him come down, and their story is that uh, Jace, the son, um, Jace Hinton wanted, he was like, Dad, can we just be the last people here? We just want to be the last people in the stands. <laughs> so... Um, so it was super fun to see him. We brought him down and they were like, you guys want to go see the locker room? Cause we just renovated the locker room. So we took them in and Jace was super hyped and Sean was great. I mean, what a patient dad, right? I mean, that's a long game and then to stay for an extra hour. And, um, so we took him to the locker room and as we're walking into the locker room, I just happened to say, or maybe Lee did, asked Jace, he's like, do you have a favorite player? Is there somebody on the team you love? And he's like, ah, oh, I just love Fus Traore. So we walk in the locker room, there's only one player left in there, <laughs> and it's Foos. And so we got to be in there, and uh, Foos, of course, is, is one of the great human beings on the planet. So he was so sweet to Jason, so sweet to Sean. And then this morning, uh, uh, Avery, who's running my social media, texted me, he's like, Dad, you got to look at this. I think Avery was there at the time. And so they sent some pictures and just talked about um, it being a meaningful experience for them. And the whole reason I'm telling this story is that's actually uh, one of the primary purposes of athletics at BYU, is we get to see these moments where it doesn't really have anything to do with the game, it doesn't have anything to do with the team, but it just has to do with a father and a son, or a grandfather and a father, or a mother and a, uh, you know, a daughter, or two sisters that just somehow come to this game and have an experience together, and I love it. So I got a huge shout out to Jason Sean Hinton. Super awesome. excited about that. We get up for them, let's go. Yeah. Greg gets so nervous, he's like, we're, the segment's no, over. No, 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 this is all you, this is all you. But uh, we were talking as a staff, um, and so it's pretty fun, because Rudy Williams, who's a great player here, uh, really helped us um, in his year here. Um, but it was a, d a difficult season in the sense of we were young and we were growing, and he had a huge role to carry as a veteran player. And so he came uh, with dreams about going to be a pro and uh, just last week had a game with 39 points wow. and four assists playing in the Austrian league, which is really great. So shout out to Rudy. Shout out Rudy. A great Canadian. So we, we got that news and as one of the highest scoring offenses in the country right now in college basketball, uh, we were like, let's just do a rundown of the guys. So here you go, Yoli Childs in Japan, averaging 13 and eight. Alex Barcelo averaging 19, four and three. Had a 29 point game last week. Zach Selyus, the great Zach Selyus. Now what countries are both these guys in? A, B so and Japan. Zach. Where, where's Alex? Spain. Spain, we got three guys in Spain. Yeah. Uh, Zach's in Germany in the first division of Germany. Rudy is in Austria. Elijah Bryant's been in double figures throughout the last five games at one of my former teams, the FS Pilsen uh, in Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, Brandon Averett, if you remember, great, great, uh, combo guard Brandon Averett uh, is in France, is averaging 15. Matt Harms is 
double figures in three of his last games in Spain. Uh, Tijan Lucas mm -hmm. just had 16 and 9 in England. And Brandon Davis, of course, the great Brandon Davis, had 20 Monday night in Spain. How great is that, man? It's so fun to have BYU people all over the world representing this place. It's pretty cool. And we know you as a former NBA player, but you just alluded to it. You've had some international experience as well as a player back yes, in the day. Yes, and Leanne has also, and it was incredibly traumatic. <laughs> we are still trying to recover. It's way different now because there's the Internet and the World Wide Web and cell phones, which didn't exist when we were doing that. Oh, gosh. That, 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 that <laughs> There's a good number of guys that are, that are, that are getting paid to play around it's the world really right great. now. And, and just, I love it. I love that, I love that people come here to BYU and have the experience and fall in love with this place and become ambassadors for this place literally all over the world. It's actually super special, and it's what BYU is supposed to be. And, and in our own tiny little slice of it with BYU basketball, we get to live it out. It's great. Great things happening with the former players and with the current players, as you guys are now 9-1. and one. We'll get the highlights in a little bit, but uh, uh, the national rankings, uh, you're in both the major polls, the AP and the coaches. Uh, Ken Palm, you're still top 10. Net, you're top 5. You're still third in the net as you pick up these wins. A lot of good numbers for BYU basketball right yeah, now. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, we dropped a game. Unfortunately, we dropped our first game, uh, it seems like weeks ago, but I think it was only last weekend. And... Um, and just as a tribute to what our guys have accomplished so far, they dropped from number one in the country to number three. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's incredible. There's not a lot of teams that are going to be number one. There's even fewer teams that are going to just drop from number one to number three. And that's, that's really a credit to our guys' focus and how they've approached every single game. And we're really proud of it. So we're excited about um, who we are and what we're trying to grow into. And I think we have a good identity, and this is fun. And excited to have a five-game homestand underway yes, right now, too. Season-long five-game yes, stand. Yep. Uh, the Big 12, uh, you've been keeping an eye out on it, I'm sure. Uh, how do you think the league's performing right now around you? Yeah, the league is really daunting. Um, so if you, in fact, you can help me with these numbers. But So there's a metric, a Ken Palm metric. It's an analytical tool that grades leagues. And so, this, so Big 12, again, is number one league in the country by far. And not only that, but the distance in the scoring metric from the Big 12 to the number two league in the country is the same as the distance from number two to number five or right. six, right? Yeah. So uh, essentially, the Big 12 is, is not just the best uh, league in this conference, but it's the best league by far. And so we got our work cut out for us, and, and that's why we're working hard right now to be ready to jump in that league and do what we can. One of the interesting things we've talked about recently, and eventually I'll give you a chance to talk, Greg. I don't need it. Is, that's good. <laughs> this is good. You're... Is, you know, one of the ways that we're seeing how different our experience right now is BYU basketball than it's been in the past is um, as you go through the season, they break up every game into a level. A quad one is two of the best teams playing against each other. A quad two is when you're playing a team that's not quite as good. A quad three is when you're playing a lower level team. And a quad four is actually the biggest range of teams, but it's the lowest level of teams. And if you lose a quad three or four game, it's super dangerous to your at-large resume. And if you lose two, sometimes you have no chance. And so um, as we used to go through our conference season, there were so many landmine games where it's just like if we lose this game we can never recover our at-large bid but starting January 6 when we begin Big 12 play we don't have a single quad three or I think we have three potential quad three games is all not a single quad four game home or away and I'm guessing by the time we get there it's gonna be all quads and ones and twos which you think is great because you don't have any landmines, but it's also really terrifying. <laughs> Doctor, but it's a different kind of pressure. You had yes. a different kind of pressure in the old yes. league of we can't slip up. Yes. Now it's a different kind of pressure of, man, every night is just a grind. Yeah, you got to find a way to win. It's yeah. just collecting wins. How many wins can you collect? And I actually, I actually, the vibe of that, approach it, I dig it, man, because I think you're on your toes chasing it rather than a little bit on your heels trying to play defense right, and be right. protective and be reproducible. We get to be a little bolder, and that's – been the bedrock of how we've chosen to play and our style of play and building this roster and we're all going to see if it works. Okay, a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, you've got finals and Christmas holiday to work around here coming up. What's going to be the schedule for you guys? You don't have too many games. You'll have like yeah. a week and then another week and then yeah. how's that all going to work with finals? So I just walked out of I just walked out of the annex five minutes, ten minutes ago and Foose is in there with his tutor because he's, uh, he's got a huge e-contest coming up uh, and that's how my guys feel. Um, you know, Atiki's got, a, his, Atiki's got his first final on Saturday morning day of game f scheduled from 7 a.m. to 11 a.m. Nice. 
It's he gets four hours, but he's, he's asking the teacher if he could have seven. <laughs> um, and so it's awesome, man. It's, it's like, it's, it's a beautiful thing being a student athlete because every student at BYU, everybody who's come through BYU, it's one of the elite academic institutions in the world. There's no easy road. It's not like we have a special um, set of courses for athletes. And so all of these guys are grinding through their classes right now and coming to practice and preparing for games and currently, you know, number three and seven and 18. And that's pretty cool. You've had a day to digest and your staff and the administration yesterday's uh, court ruling, temporary restraining order, yeah. striking down the waiver uh, restrictions. Marcus Adams Jr. is involved in that whole yeah. scenario. Now that you've sat with it for a little while, where, where do we land right now with Marcus? Well, it just got weirder today. So it, it's like unraveling moment by moment. It's one of the really difficult things about where we are as an organization in the NCAA right now is we rarely are ahead of things. We're kind of reacting all the time. So. Um, yesterday, there was a ruling in the courts in Ohio that uh, essentially said that for the next 14 days, they were going to end the transfer limitations to the two-time transfer rule. So every single two-time transfer um, in college basketball right now for the next 14, is el 14 days is eligible to play. And there are a bunch of caveats to that and complicated things. And so we're like, wow, it's a free 14 days. But today, and they also said there would be no puni. There, there if be someone plays, punitive they can't be punished plays. afterwards. Now, but, what's, yeah, what's yeah. complicated is that today they came out with a clarification that said if you choose to play in these 14 days, and they have another hearing, uh, I guess, 13 days from now, and if they decide that they are reinstating the two time transfer limitation, then not only are you not allowed to play the rest of the season, so you only get that two weeks to play, but you've also burned a year of eligibility. Yeah. That is really poor decision making, <laughs> in my opinion, um, from the NCAA, because now you've left, you know, we, we talk about caring about student athletes, but what we've done is we've left student athletes in an untenable situation, which is we're saying you can play right now, we're saying it's totally legal to play right now, but if you choose to play right now and we make a different decision 13 days from now, you're burning your whole season, you won't be able to get I just don't understand how that can possibly be the best we can do. Um, again, I'm not the smartest person in the room ever, but that's really frustrating for us. So, um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, we're doing a lot of considering. Uh, Marcus uh, had his first almost full practice day and he was terrific. So, um, we'll see. A little bit of limbo right now. Limbo. Yeah. We okay. Do we have a limbo poll, Hema? We can have uh, the coach uh, dance under uh, in the next segment. We should do limbo during the, uh, <laughs> during the TV timeout. People would love to see that here in the studio audience. Yes. Uh, all right, so we talked oh, with the, the studio. The audience. I'll have them take part. Yes. Uh, we we talk can kill limbo. Like it's, I've never seen anything like it. Yeah. Let's get the highlights. Uh, we had the Utah game. We're not going to show that. We're going to get to last night's win. <laughs> Greg totally <laughs> feels like this has been derailed. The reason my opening was so long was so we could avoid the Utah game. It, it, it worked perfectly. Yes. Yes. So we're going we're gonna to go down to one game of highlights, and that was last night. Game one of the five-game homestand. Denver was in town. Yep. The Pioneers, first time they played in Provo in 25 years. Let's take a look at how things went down last night at the Marriott Center. BYU and DU. Cougars and Pioneers, they came in with a uh, couple of really high-scoring players. BYU, nice start. In fact, uh, didn't trail all night. Yeah, it, it was really fun. I mean, a fun challenge for us. They, we, I don't know if we've ever faced two scores that are average 24 and 18. Like, I just don't remember. I guess he was the number six scorer in the country. He was number the three coming into the, number the, the game. Number three scorer in the country. Um, and I Bruner. thought our guys were unbelievable in their first half approach to guarding. I was most pleased with us on the defensive end, especially in the first half. And then uh, Noah Waterman uh, put together an uh, unbelievable performance. Um, Stat-wise, as a 20-point guy with 14 rebounds and zero turnovers again, there's a reason why he picked that number, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so he's a zero turnover guy. But even more imp importantly was what he did on the defensive end, um, having to guard both of those top scorers. He actually had to start on the four and switch on to the point guard and, and did a really commendable job on the defensive end. We had huge contributions with a lot of guys. Spencer Johnson, unbelievable focus on the defensive end. Uh, Really proud of the guys. Highlights and stats presented by Intermountain Health as BYU wins it 90 to 74 to complete the split decision after the weekend setback on the hill. And you mentioned the, the 14 rebounds for Noah. When you consider that his previous collegiate high was eight, yeah. he went, he almost doubled his number last yeah. night. And you know, it was interesting after the Utah game, and this, this goes to, it's another sign of his incredible maturity as a player. 
So after the Utah game, of course, he was really upset that we lost, that we didn't play as well as we wanted to. But like the stat that he held on is I only had four rebounds. He was so devastated he only had four rebounds. And that's a game where I had 17 offensive rebounds in a team, and we out-rebounded Utah, a team that's much bigger than us. But he was just like, one of my principal jobs is to go rebound the ball. You get, you get guys on your team where that's their focus and really special things happen. And, man, he's just been incredible this year. I'm really proud of him, really happy for him, and it's been fun. Yeah, great bounce back for and, Noah and the team as a result. You know, we just did that whole segment, and neither one of us uh, mentioned Jackson Robinson. How crazy is that? 28 points, career high for him. Yes. Uh, eight threes, puts himself among the top three-point numbers uh, that BYU's ever had. In yeah. fact, it ties the most threes in a home game in BYU basketball history. At well, eight. and everybody take a breath, but the truth is, is when we go to commercial break, you come down here, Jim or Fredette was sitting right, this is where they have a studio, right? Uh, just down the hall. Oh, yeah. sorry. I take it back. It's all right. Anyway, Jim was doing the game, and apparently he was a little nervous that Jax was going to break his record also, and <laughs> he came up one three short from tying, so... <laughs> And then Great. shout out as well to uh, Chase Fisher, who holds the BYU record yeah, for Chase threes in a Fisher. game with 10. West Virginia legend. Oh, man, I want to catch up with that guy. Chase Fisher. Uh, if we had an, another show, I have stories <laughs> about our official recruiting visit out to his ranch in West Virginia. My gosh. Woo. That dude is a character. Yes, he is. Yes. We miss him. He, he's I know. a legend here. Like I said, I'd love to catch up. All right. As we.